And now we're going to switch gears and talk about another subject that is very near and dear to my heart, and that, of course, is girls and women as catalysts for growth and change. So I'd like to introduce our panel because we have a distinguished panel of guests who are going to share their perspectives with us, three individuals who have led successful efforts to educate and empower girls and women in the developing world. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. First, Rasa Michelle, President, Foundation for Community Development. In addition to being married to Nelson Mandela, Mrs. Michelle maintains her active presence in her native Mozambique while she was Minister of Education and Culture there. We'll tell you about some of the changes she's been able to implement in girls' education and in boys' education in a moment. Next to Rasa is Anne Njogu, who is the co-founder of Center for Rights, Education, and Awareness in Kenya. <laughs> We should congratulate Anne on recently winning the 2010 International Women of Courage Award. And finally, Alma Obama, Technical Advisor for CARE International Sports for Social Change Initiative. Alma is pioneering in a program in East Africa that uses sports as a tool for social change. So please, once again, welcome our panel. So I, w I was going to start on a personal note before we talk about the, the social and political ramifications of your outstanding work, and that is, was there mo a moment in time, a person who inspired you or some kind of epiphany you had during your formative years that motivated you to all work towards uh, increasing gender equality in your particular spheres? Do you want to start that, Rasa? Yes, I will. But before I answer your question, can I change a little bit? I was introduced saying, in addition to having married this <laughs> Nelson Mandela, well, I would say maybe despite the fact that I married Nelson Mandela. Well, if that's, Rasa, that's what it said on the copy? Yes, but I, I, that don't know, I don't know who put that. I don't know who put that. I just want to say, well, my, my formative years, I was, uh, I was born in a family of uh, six children. My mother had to bring us all three boys and three girls precisely the same way. I was not able to elaborate on that when I was very young, but much later it helped me to understand the power of how you educate in your own family, boys and girls equally. But I became Minister of Education in the best of times in Mozambique, immediately after independence. Education had been denied as a right to millions of Mozambicans. I wouldn't be wrong if I say we had inherited the highest rate of illiteracy in Africa. 93% of our people were illiterate. So we made it a pledge, a fundamental pledge in changing and affirming the meaning of independence. It was to provide uh, conditions for everyone to get access to education. So it was not like uh, my personal achievement, but it was a, a collective effort of the liberation movement in power at the time. And we mobilized from families to communities to all institutions, social and political institutions, to make of education a prime right in a way we are going to change our society. That's why the results which came out, many times I referred as if I was leading, but we as a movement and as government, we're very much committed to. Well, we should mention, because I didn't say these statistics when I introduced you, but primary school enrollment in Mozambique increased from 40% of children in 1975 to over 90% of boys and 75% of girls mm -hmm. by 1989, mm -hmm. which is really an extraordinary achievement. It was, but also I may have to, to uh, uh, add that the philosophy of the liberation movement itself was exactly of equality. So we engage 
families and communities to say, boys and girls, they have equal rights and they should be given an opportunity to go to school. As you can see, we didn't succeed to have the same percentage. It came close, but because of cultural reasons, there were communities where we were not successful to have equally girls in schools as boys. But it, there was a general uh, mobilization which helped to make it happen. And we'll get to some of those cultural obstacles mm -hmm. in a moment, but first I want to ask An Njogu, who as I mentioned is co-founder of Center for Rights, Education and Awareness. An, what was it in your, your background that inspired you to push for greater equality for girls? Uh, thank you, Cathy, and uh, this awesome um, gathering of world business leaders for the opportunity to share with you my story and the story of our work in Kenya. Um, like Brasha, I was born in a large family of seven. I'm the third-born girl, um, and uh, I grew up in a very sheltered family. Very, very. My mother was a teacher. My father was an a mechanical engineer. It's sort of like in a middle-class family. And uh, I was very sheltered from the, 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 the social inequities because I went to some privileged school or so. Now, I, 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 I graduated from law school as an advocate of the high court, uh, fast-tracked my career through the insurance industry and rose very fast to you know, the company secretary um, at a very high level in one of the biggest insurance companies. And despite my rise in, uh, in my meteoric rise in the corporate world, a time came when I couldn't get beyond, I used to wake up every morning and ask myself, give Ann five reasons why you must go to work. And I would say, I need the money, I need the money, I need the money. <laughs> and clearly, it, it started becoming such a drag for me because I couldn't just wake up. And I was so, you know, it, I, I didn't have the, my purpose, I, didn't, I couldn't connect with my center. And it just took me two, uh, two weeks in a training on human rights in Sweden. For me to understand, I wanted to use my human rights background to work for the underprivileged women, and therefore came and started the, the center. And since then, I have never, ever lacked the reason. Every day, I'm inspired by the phenomenal women I work with. Women in the village, a woman who wakes up at 4 a.m. to go and you know, till her tired land and eke out a living to feed an entire clan. A woman who uh, is able to feed her family of five in, you know, in under, you know, using under less, you know, less than a dollar a day, and be able to feed them and give them a life of dignity and still not give up. Those are the people who inspire me on a daily, you know, on a daily basis. And every morning when I go out and see how my work touches them, how my, how, you know, what I do for them transforms their lives. I can tell you I have energy, I have focus, I have dynamism. I'm able to go every day. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> so it was almost a lack of inspiration in your own life that inspired you to make a change. And now, obviously, it's, it's been a change for the better. Alma, what about you? Um, you are, I, I'll just repeat, technical advisor for Care International Sports for Social Change Initiative. Yeah. Um, well, my story is probably not as inspiring because you asked me for a personal story. But first of all, I just want to link in with what you talked about in your, the, the, the presentation you gave, which I, I found really impressive, and I want to thank you for that. Oh, and it's in keeping with what I believe in, because really, I believe that women really make a difference with regards to growth and change, because you changed a lot in what happened to you, you took your experience, and millions and millions of dollars have been raised to improve people's lives and to do something about an illness that people are so afraid of, and you're a woman. So there you are. This is what we're talking about already. When it comes to me personally, it's a really simple story. I was eight years old. I come from uh, an ethnic group in Kenya called the Luo. And in our tradition, it's very patriotic. And my grandmother is, 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 is very, very, she would tease me a lot. And I was eight and she would tell me that um, there's a 50-year-old neighbor who, if I don't behave, she will marry me off to. <laughs> and I was really afraid because in our culture we'd be told stories that traditionally, if a man wants to marry you, when you're going to get fetch water at the river, he can come and just drag you and take you to his home and you're his wife. And if he drags you and take you, takes you to his home, your parents can't take you back. So I had this fear that as a girl I had no choice. And I would constantly ask, 
Why is it do I, that I don't have a choice? Why can I just be taken? And my grandmother would joke. It, later I found out she was joking, but when you're eight, you know, you don't know. So I would hear that, well, it's because you're a girl and you belong to the men. You, know, you belong to a man's family. And that made such an impression on me that I actually, when I was eight years old, as old I said, no man is going to own me. I know that's very extreme, so don't hold, hold, me, hold that against me. But at the time, I was like, no man is going to own me. I'm going to determine my own destiny. And I have, for my work, every time I see a young person, be it a young person in the West or, or, or in, in our part of the world, I always say, there by the grace of God go I, depending on what her situation is. Because any of those girls could have me, been me. But I had the advantage that I was in a family that I got mentoring. I had people who were there to support me. I had people who showed me the way. I got a good education. I got, all, I, I got a certain self-confidence that allowed me to have options and opportunities to be able to determine my own life. And I work with underprivileged young people who don't have all of that. Very often they have absolutely nothing and their families have nothing to offer them, even if they do want to do better for them. And I know that I have that position and that responsibility within the work that I do that, to open doors to make opportunities available to these young people. And that's what motivates me. That's what keeps me doing the work I do because I don't see myself as any different. I just see myself as having had opportunities and because of that, it's my obligation to make open doors for the young people and especially for girls. We're gonna talk about some of the wonderful solutions that you all are focused on in, in your respective areas. But first, let's talk about the biggest obstacles that still exist for girls and women, for that matter, in the developing world. We've made many strides in the United States, but still women don't make an equal wage with men. There still is a lot of de facto sex sexism, uh, and, and women aren't in enough leadership positions, certainly um, in, when related to the, the level they are within the population. But when it comes to your countries and your communities, what are some of the biggest problems that are holding girls back? I think uh, we have to put in, in two different levels. The first one, which I think it belongs to governments. Governments have to make of uh, a policy, and when I say policy, it's not only to state it, but you have to put systems and mechanisms and processes which allows the state from top down to make sure that the exercising of rights by girls and women is facilitated. It is not made difficult. The other level then is from grassroots up. It's from families, it is from communities, and of course sometimes it's uh, the cultural setting in which you are. I think V, it's where we find much more difficulties in terms of change, because culture takes long to change. But nevertheless, you have to combine the positive of what is the community life, but re-examining with the communities why discriminating against girls is not in the interest of families, in the interest of communities. People have to understand that, that changing it's not only in the interests of girls, but it's in the interest so that they can have a more vibrant community, they'll have much healthier environment. Many times when we talk, for instance, in education, we say we have to educate girls so that they will be this. I have to state that we have to educate girls because of themselves first, mm -hmm. because they're citizens and they have to be able to exercise fully their rights, and as she was mentioning, to have the ability to make choices about their lives, about what they want to do, and how they want to relate to others. So these two levels of the state and the family and communities have strongly to work together to change. It is what we call tradition, and also even religion. So this, 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 these are the ways I think we, 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 should be, we should be. But let me tell you a good story, just to, to mention some of the stories we came across with as elders. We had a meeting recently in Johannesburg, an organization based in Senegal, which has been working with the communities to uh, challenge the 
practice and the tradition of uh, 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 genital mutilation. In 10 years' time, working with 15 communities, using the human rights framework, they were able to get families and community leaders, including religious leaders, to come out and say, this practice is not going to continue in our communities. 10 years' time, it's short when you are to change culture. But it shows that whether there is a, a very concerted and focused strategy in which you involve, and I'm saying they use the framework of human rights, which may sound very theoretical and philosophical, but you bring it to a level where people own this philosophy of protecting rights, and they challenge their practices, and they embrace a broader understanding of how to protect one another, and how to care for one another, and how to promote the potential of one another, including girls and women. So it can be done. But I think one of the problems we have many times is that we, we, we tend to work in general terms and we don't go to specifics of each community, each ethnic group, because they differ in the way they are going to own the agenda and to accept to change. So methodologies of how you deal with this have to change, in my opinion. Second, we have to accept that never mind that it can, the, the change can be slow, but change is possible. We have to be consistent, we have to be persistent, and we have to learn the lessons and in the process you adjust the methodologies you are using. How would you all suggest that the sort of mindsets are altered? Because I think that's one of the biggest obstacles. There's these very age-old traditions and, and, and uh, attitudes that are so deeply ingrained about the role of women and girls in various societies. We just heard an example of how got, getting the community and religious leaders altered opinions on, on genital mutilation, but what about just on the role of girls and what they have the potential of doing when so many cultures view them as mm -hmm. second-class citizens and basically there to have sex with or to bear children? How do you, how do you get people to shift that focus? I think uh, the first, um, I, I draw a lot from the analogy of a caged bird because the caged bird that, um, you know, if you put a bird in a cage and uh, it doesn't understand, and in this, cage, in this case I want to say the cage is the patriarchy, the socialization, the, the years and years of um, continued disempowerment that makes, uh, you know, the women and the girls not believe in themselves. So the first thing that uh, if you're put in a cage, you can believe that, um, you know, uh, this cage, you need to expand the cage so that you can make yourself more comfortable. And then you can, first and foremost, you can decide there is no alternative. This cage is where you're supposed to be in and there is no other way. The second thing is to see whether maybe you can seek to expand that cage and be comfortable, have more leg room, have more headspace, but still, there is the, 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 the last, and which is the transformative way of uh, doing this, dismantling the cage and gaining utmost freedom. And this is what women and girls need to do, to dismantle that cage of um, patriarchy, of socialization, of discrimination, of non-equality. And how do you do this? The first thing that you need to do, because this is about information and lack of it. So the first place from where I stand is that we need to have unlimited access to information by the women and girls to enable them sit in the driver's seat of their lives to be able to drive to their destiny. That destiny will be a destiny where they have information to make the right decisions about their health, about their bodies, about their own uh, situations of in, the, in the economic sense, about their political participation. And I agree with my mentor, who has mentored and continues to mentor me from far. I'm in Kenya, she's in South Africa, I follow you closely, and I watch what you do, and uh, you inspire me vastly. And, 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 and to, to, to see that um, you can be able to have this, um, you, you can be able to have this objective and in, you know, unlimited access to information that will enable you 
deconstruct the socialization. And later when I talk about our work with the media, we, we will see how we made that connection, that uh, we need to have a critical mass of socially aware people. And when we talk about women in Africa, we've also understood because of our work that it is not enough to talk to the women and the girls. Mm. We must use the force of media to create communities that respect human rights, communities that buy in into the agenda of empowering women, communities that actually make it their duty to understand that the community will only be as great as its most vulnerable. And that if it doesn't make itself the stepping stone for the women to, you know, to step on, then you know, to a greater place, then they, all they do is null and void and will never be you know, truly transformational. So it includes expanding okay. the cage for women, but also Abs educating the we male population. We must dismantle the cage. I was going to because it's not just about the cage. Exactly. Because having more leg room in the cage is about welfare approaches. Let us give, you know, and, and, and really our work, we, we started off in the, you know, working on gender-based violence. It took us a very short time to understand that gender-based violence was just a symptom of a larger societal problem. Then we went on asking ourselves, what causes, uh, you know, gender violence? And we came to the questions of patriarchy, the socialization, issues of bride price, which enable one person to own and purchase another person, therefore, when they are abusing, because when you talk to perpetrators, they say, it's my property. I can do with it what I want. And then moving from that to asking ourselves, what about the laws that can safeguard these people, you know, the women and the vulnerables in community? And then we saw that the laws by themselves, even if they're there, are not enough. We need to have that consciousness and a critical mass of aware people who understand that it is wrong to abuse your wife. It is wrong to have your sister in a situation that is not a win-win situation. That when you do not have conducive working environment in the office, that then enables um, various um, you know, uh, people to continue the abusive cycle in the, in the work environment, that, that your company can't, be, can't realize its fullest uh, goal and objective. All these are connected. Can I add something here? I have been involved with women's movement and think one of the mistakes we made at the beginning is that we concentrated only on girls and women and we didn't bring boys and men on board. Dismantling socialization, as she mentioned, it means also to dismantle the way boys and men are brought up and they believe who they are and how they should relate to the other. And I think one of the allies of women's movement has to be exactly how do we change the mentality of boys and men to feel that they will be better human beings when they accept that women are also full human beings. They are not second class citizens, as you, you, you were saying. And the, to, 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 to do this, I think many of us, we have to challenge, for instance, those men who are adults to look at their own daughters. In African context, you can do whatever you want to do to a man. You can tell whatever, but don't touch his daughter. Mm -hmm. Don't touch his daughter. And second, don't touch his mother. So we have to ask every one of these of this men to say, what is you would like to see to your own daughter, how you would like your daughter to grow in an environment where she can fully exercise and have her potential developed. And then bring it back home that, you know, this is your daughter. And even your wife is somebody's daughter. And because of that, this, 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 this bringing home into the heart of men in how they have to change, it needs a discourse which it touches them, including in their emotions, which is not only, I mean, intellectual, but in their emotions to begin to look at what they would like, their daughters, their sisters, how they would like their mother to continue to be respected as the one who have nurtured them. And I think we, may, we have been making the mistake of leaving them out, and that this is something we have to change. Alma, you're challenging, yeah. you're challenging yeah. stereotypes and, and, and yeah. dealing with limited possibilities through the world of sports, which I think probably is an incredible equalizer in many of these communities. Well, you can tell us if it is. How has that impacted sort of the status 
of girls that goes beyond the playing field? Maybe I can refer back to what we were talking about as, as before as well, because I think within CARE we found a few answers. Because when you talk about the fact about the community taking ownership, our, the, the men taking ownership, culture changing, religion changing, I think we have to realize that we know that already. Everybody knows that it's wrong. Domestic violence is wrong. Child abuse is, is wrong. Everybody knows what the situation is on the table. It's just how do we do something about it? What, is the, what, what can we do practically about it? And what we've done by care, at, with CARE, and what I find really fantastic within the program that we, we do, is we have a program that is called The Power Within. And I find this absolutely just the perfect word or the perfect phrase for what we do. Because what we're doing is we're working, we don't just work with girls, but in this particular space, because you're talking about the one space of getting the community involved, getting the men involved, getting everybody else involved. And what we do is we then go and say, fine, we've got everybody involved, but what about the girl child herself? Because you can have all the information in the world. We have internet access. We all have all the information we want. But very many people still think that in Africa we've got the sun, the sand, and the animals, and poor people. Everybody can access the internet and find out about great African people. But generally, people don't go and look at the information. Even if they get information, you're almost feeding it to them. And what we are trying to do is say that we need to go and target the so-called victim in this case. And go and find that young girl and tell her she has power within her. And within that program, we have a leadership program where we try, one is we try to make sure she gets educated in the context of getting information, getting an awareness. But just getting educated isn't enough because once she's educated, she'll still go and do what her father says, her brother says, tradition says, the religion says. She will be that obedient girl and do what she has to do. It's, it's, I see that as the visual of when you're, you're driving in a car and, and, and there's a hare in the, in the road and it, gets, it sees the danger ahead, but it stays. You have young women, women, you have girls who still stay in that cage, even if it's a golden cage. So what we're trying to do is get the girl out of the cage, but she has to, not, she has to dismantle that cage. The society can take ownership and say they want to be party to it, but she has to dismantle that cage. She has to find that power within her with all the assistance we can give her. She has to realize that she herself is a leader. She has the potential to determine her life. And once we get our young women and the girls in that space, we're working on this together because she takes ownership of it. And what we do to use sports. Before you get yeah. to sports though, I just yeah. wanted to ask you, Alma, do you have role models? In other words, it's very scary and intimidating for a young girl to take control of her life yes. and to, to fight stereotypes or the social norms in her culture. Do you have other women in addition yes. to professionals such as yourself who kind of join forces with her because I think there's tremendous power in sisterhood and numbers. What we do is even, we, we, go, we go better, we do better than that. We have peers. You use your own peers. And what we do is we have within our program a leadership program where the girls are taught, and, and we use sports. Sports is one of the big things that we use because, I mean, the power of a girl playing football and playing it better than her brother and being able to score a goal and win when her brother can't, that can't, that is powerful. He will be unhappy at first. And immediately we realized that we had to create our own media house where we would use the social media, mobile telephony, uh, uh, you know, uh, Twitter, blogs, and um, you know, Facebook to be able to communicate this. Right now, if you log on to www.safariafricaradio, you can be able to listen to our radio online. But we are only online by default, not by design. We wanted to have a frequency where we could communicate to a larger public because our, our public is the most disadvantaged in society, the bottom of the pyramid. However, we are not able to get a frequency because we are given to understand by our government that these are exhausted and um, we are still exploring how to go around that. Then we decided to go online in as much as we only have about 3 million Kenyans who have access to the internet. But that really would have wanted us to deal with our, with our you know, bottom of the pyramid um, communities. Then we decided, how are we going to go about this question of um, the, 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 the women in the villages, the men in the villages do not have 
internet access, forget about uh, the skills to navigate online. How are we going to uh, do this? And we decided we were going to work through community radio. You know, community radio is one of the most versatile and most uh, phenomenal ways of uh, reaching people. Radio today is still the most uh, powerful medium of communication. We have about 16.7 million Kenyans <coughs> with, uh, with the radio and uh, who listen to radio. We have about 7.5 million who own their own on radio sets. Now we have mobiles. We have about one of the fastest growing uh, mobile uh, terrains in Africa. We have about 17 million Kenyans with access to a mobile phone. We are still exploring how we can be able to use this as a tool for development, as a, to, you know, as a tool to be able to reach to, to, the, uh, to the masses because a woman with her mobile set can be able to you know, receive information that is a phenomenal, that is empowering, that is life changing. But through community radio, we shall set about 200 and 10 community radio stations across the 210 constituencies. We have understood the power of information in the right hands because uh, our, my, my, you know, uh, the Honorable Lady next to me, Grasha Marshall, was one of the mediators when Kenya got one of the, you know, we had one of the biggest crises. And why we had that crisis is because a small political elite is, a, is, is, an, is, is able to manipulate issues, manipulate the historical injustices issue in a manner that can cause real and you know conflict that can bring the whole country to a to a halt but with community radio where people are able to prioritize their agendas they talk about their issues 24 7 explore the myths and the, the facts and be able to be in charge of this how more can they be able to make decisions that regardless of what the political elite does they don't care because they know what they are anchored on and what is important in their lives. That is what we're doing with community radio. So you're able to manip manip manipulate in a positive <laughs> way the message through this new medium. Yes. And, but, but how do you, how you, now that you have this, this new medium, how do you really you know, influence public opinion? I mean, you sort, sort of talked about it towards the end, but it's how can you get change how can you change minds through that venue because changing minds is not something that you do uh, on a one workshop like a forum like this even if i wanted to i cannot come here and bang you know, say we must move away from this and shift it. Sometimes it ha happens, but changing mindset is about hearing ab the same message over and over again, interrogating that message, being able to participate in um, validating that message, owning that message, buying into that message, being able to run with the agenda because you've bought in, you've understood the rationale, you've understood the dynamics, you are able, you are, you're in a position to uh, really decide what is influential. Now, social media is very participatory. It's very interactive. It is very uh, centered on people because it's about me. If I send you a message and you decide this message, I want to pass it to my 20 friends on my ebook, it's because you understand, on, on my phone book, it's because you understand that that message will be important to your friend or your mother or your family or your other the community members. And they will also pass it to somebody else. So if, for example, we sent out a message on, um, for example, the, why the right to health is a right as opposed to being a favor by the government. And that message is, um, you know, text and passed on to communities of people who understand that message and they pass it to other people. We can be able to mobilize whole communities around an issue that can be able to change policy and therefore change lives. That sounds very exciting and fantastic. And, and Grassi, you're doing another initiative called New Faces, New Voices. And you've been doing, I guess you announced that at your March conference, I believe. Can you tell us what that is and what that <laughs> entails? New Faces, New Voices is uh, um, a network of uh, professional women in finance. We decided to take advantage of the financial crisis uh, global financial crisis where um, we hear leaders in different levels talking about rethinking, reshaping, rebuilding. And we asked ourselves, where is the voice of women in this uh, reshaping and rebuilding? So the group of women uh, who s founded this movement are in different levels of the financial system. And they are questioning uh, leaders of the financial sector 
be them regulators, be them development banks, commercial banks, microfinance, uh, insurance uh, companies, to say, how can you, in a certain period of time, look inwards your institution and identify and put in place systems and processes which would lead women to high positions within your institution. We believe that participation of women in the decision making in the financial sector will make the financial sector healthier. And of course, for us also, it's a right for women to be there to articulate whatever are the lines and the directions where the financial sector should go. But the other line of, our, of the work of New Faces, New Voices is to interrogate why is it that in the formal sector, there's very little of women in Africa particularly, very little of women who have assets to financial resources. What is it? What is impeding women to get? We have uh, successful stories in microfinance, but very little really in women who move from the small to the medium and from medium to high, I mean, to top business. And that's what we are working with these different institutions. We held a conference in Nairobi exactly to engage leaders to look at these two directions. We identified those we call drivers of change, those who are willing to work with us and in a period of two years to be able to come up not only with the identification of these obstacles but with a very clear plan of what can be done in the next three years and after that we'll have another plan of five years. What we are envisaging is if in the leadership of the financial system we have more women as executive top management and even as CEOs. At the same time, we scale up in millions, I'm saying in millions, women who can have assets to financial resources to own business, to lead their own business. This is going to make our nations, it's going to make our continent successful in terms of how we open up much more opportunities to women. And the, the conversation here w w was meant to be about why is it important to, uh, to empower women. I, I, I believe any nation which wants to be successful cannot afford to leave about 50% of its brain power, of its talent, of its potential expertise, of its energy. And, you know, this is entrepreneurship which women do represent, to leave it outside and then you want to move with only half and you want to be successful. There's no way. And we are using the financial system to begin with because this crisis has a window, a window which can close quickly. And before it closes, then we would like to have these two issues of women in the financial system precisely at the center stage. But we are working with other groups also, like women in agriculture, but agriculture in entrepreneurial agriculture. Again, because women in our continent, they produce and they feed our nations. But it, look at when it comes to shaping policy, women are not consulted. When it comes to allocation of resources, they are the last to get resources to do their own business. When it comes to how do you define the priorities of where we should be going in terms of agriculture, whether it is for food production or it's commercial, women are not consulted. And we say they have a right to influence that sector in which in majority there are women who are making it work. And we have also the ambition of doing the same with women in science. Because uh, Africa has made, is making significant progress when it comes to political participation. You look around, I mean, in the last decade, we have more 
women in government, we have more women in parliament. So not that we are doing well, but there is progress and the agenda is very clear there. We even have in many African countries targets which we have to achieve. But in, in the business sector, in the, in, the, in the scientific part of it, in the media even, to influence the media, the way women are portrayed, there's no clarity which we can say, all of us, we know exactly what is the policy, the strategy, the targets, what we have to achieve in a period of 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So new faces, new voices is really to say the face of women has to be there. But more importantly, their voice has to be heard loud and clear as part of the policy formulation, policy implementation, definition of uh, priorities, and definition of strategies, whatever you want. But women have to take their rightful place in the leading of our societies and of our, our, our continent. So, this is part of a major program, we call it Multiplying Faces, Amplifying Voices of African Women. Mm -hmm. If you look around also, I mean, in terms of who are those who represent African women, this generation, you will count them today maybe in hundreds, but there are millions of them, millions. You'll, in every sector, you'll find them in millions. But they don't have the visibility, and as I'm saying, their voice is not heard, or at least it's fragmented and it's not strong. So it's, it's really to try to use all opportunities to get African women with their talent, with their ability to influence change, with their expertise and their energy to make our families work better to make our communities be better, our nations, our continent, but more importantly, for them to exercise fully, fully their own rights. In fact, can I? Can yeah, I just, you know, we're almost something? out of time, but Alma and, and, and Anne, not Anne, Anne, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, she's mm. on. Mm. Um, can, can I let you all just close things by saying we just heard uh, a very passionate, and, and inspirational call to action and, and what's being done. As you look ahead, what do you think is the most important thing that needs to be achieved in the immediate future and really in the distant future as well? I think I can just uh, add on to what uh, Gracia Machel has said because basically what, what she's saying is that you know, we, we started this thing saying that we want to, see, to talk about how women can bring about change and, and, and how we can make sure they grow but in actual fact, what we're saying is that we are there, we are bringing about change, we are growing. And basically, we actually want to institutionalize it. We don't mm. want it to be hidden. We don't want it to be behind doors. Mm. I will say women are powerful. It's just that nobody wants to talk about it and nobody brings it out. Right. And it's time that that is done, you know, yeah. that we make it become something that is part of the status quo. Mm -hmm. And real quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In closing, I would just say that uh, women are phenomenal. Women are resilient. Women are innovative. Women are the enterprise entrepreneurs, women are the new, you know, make up 50% of the new markets, new frontiers for business. And nobody can afford to ignore 50% of your prospective business, you know, market mm -hmm. and hope that you're going to succeed. And this is going to be through socially responsible corporate citizens who are willing to invest in transformation as opposed to welfare, who are willing to go into it for the long partnerships, not for hit and run, exploit, extract, and leave <laughs> the women high and dry. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of call right. that we need to see our awesome audience participating in and buying into because this is what is going to make them win in their various business opportunities when they leverage the power of 50% of the market for the benefit of everyone in society. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, Grasa Michelle and Njogu and Alma Obama. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Wonderful Thank to hear you. from you. Thank you. And now um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Andy Soar, who is the, let me make sure I have Andy's title, the managing editor of Fortune Magazine. Andy. Oh, okay. Hey, yeah, you need to get in more of that. You need to get in. Hello. 
Thank you, Katie. That was a, a great discussion. Uh, really appreciate that.